All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this week's VMware Cloud Customer Success Office Hours for the American and EMEA time zones. Uh, my name is Will Rodbard, and joining me as a fellow panelists, we have Matt Vandermeld, who is the original author of this series, and Zach Zumbar. Zumbar? Zach? I can never pronounce your surname, mate. I'm really sorry. I've yeah, just, that's right. I just I thought I just abused your surname. I, I do apologise. And then we also have a couple of other folks joining us live on our Zoom session. Um, we have Alicia, Steve, and Vijay. Hello to you, folks. Um, as per normal on this, we uh, we open up the floor to questions. If you're on the Zoom session, there is a Q and A panel, and if you're watching. Uh, live via Twitch, there is the uh, stream chat as well. So please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, I wanted to, I don't really have a huge amount, as as most of my colleagues know, or all of my colleagues know, because they've not been able to get hold of me for a month now. I've, I've literally had a month off for parental leave. So um, I feel like I'm coming back into work and don't know anything. <laughs> And, and have had about seven hours sleep over the last month as well. But um, it's all good. It's good fun. Um, so what I would um, invite you all to do is to ask any questions. But what I what I did on coming back to work myself, as you can see on the screen here, um, and for those on the Zoom session, I'll share that screen too. Um, I'm just currently looking at the release notes because, as you'll have noticed, um, we had a, a new major release, Milestone 8. Uh, or version 1.8 as it's listed here um, that came out on the 22nd of August so I was going to run through a, a few of those features and then if anybody wanted to jump and ask any questions about them or if anybody wanted to uh, ask any other VMC or VMware related questions we uh, will endeavour to answer them so if there are no questions for now or if you're a little bit shy please feel free to type rather than chat um, I thought I would just run down the new features, actually run up from bottom to top, uh, and we could have a quick chat about those. Um, let's have a look. Um, so uh, we were looking at storage. So um, VMware Cloud on AWS Storage now powered by vSAN offers better performance on i3 metal hosts. Um, so uh, some of the uh, some of the reduced uh, sorry, increased performance was around reduced jitter and increased sequential I/O throughput. Something that uh, a number of our customers were asking for. Um, uh, Zach or Double Z, um, as I refer to you, any any thoughts on uh, or any uh, experience of the uh, the improved storage yet? Have you managed to deploy anything on there? Uh, so we redeployed our our SDDC for the, for our team, uh, but haven't really done any performance testing on it or anything. But mm -hmm. the redeploy uh, went fine and everything looks good. Cool. Um, so any, any other major um, things you saw as part of the redeploy action? Um, anything that you came across that looked new or funky that uh, you hadn't seen before? Um, no, not really. It was pretty much the same. The UI didn't really change anything, uh, so I went through fine. Just plugged in pretty much the same settings as before, so there wasn't anything drastic as far as the actual process of redeploying. Cool. So that that actually raises a, a fair point that um, although we've up we've updated it and done a fair amount of changes in the background from a, uh, a UI perspective, a usability perspective, not really any uh, major changes that you saw. So uh, no no increased learning overhead, I'd say. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Um, so uh, we also now offer the uh, Elastic vSAN dynamic storage scale up option. Um, so we can um, scale out your your um, storage clusters, um, giving up to 35 uh, terabytes per host. So the new capability is supported only with the Elastic vSAN clusters. Um, so that's using basically, um, a, a, I'm not say shim, but vSAN sitting on top of uh, EBS volumes. So we have the, the native scalability of AWS EBS volumes with the same look and feel and functionality as you get from your uh, within host vSAN storage. Okay, um, any any questions on the uh, vSAN storage or Elastic vSAN stuff there, anybody? 
No, okay. Um, so we also now allow you to create multiple stretch clusters with Elastic vSAN, um, as opposed to just a single one that you had before. Um, I, again, another feature that was uh, greatly asked for, I guess, by our um, customers so far. Um, and uh, the, the next one's particularly good for me because our, I think I've probably answered the question for customers um, about a thousand times so far, and that is we've now offered the distributed firewall um, uh, as a standard feature on AWS and removed the warning banner. So uh, I think even though um, there was no charge for it, the fact that it said in future releases there would be a charge for it, that caused me uh, more questions than anything else, I think, um, in the in the run up to my uh, my extended leave so i'm if nothing else i'm, I'm glad that the the banner has been removed but uh, i guess happier for everybody that uh, dfws are now standard functionality as well you agree z double z uh yeah that was good to get that banner removed <laughs> just to reduce confusion but yeah it's good that it's uh i think it's good that it's included obviously the more features we can having the baseline is makes it more appealing uh, absolutely and and the, the the reduction of uh i guess costing options um simplifies things as well so um i guess everybody wants as many features as they can get but sometimes it gets a bit um overbearing to to mix and match to get everything you want right so the more we shove into the base model the better for customers that is obviously um, actually, uh, VJ uh, on the uh, Zoom session has asked us a question. So Elastic vSAN is available with the i3 node. Um, uh, actually, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Z, do you, are, you, uh, are you aware? It's just the native i3 node comes with Elastic vSAN capability? No, I think it's just the R5. OK. Which so, has the, the EBS back storage. Yeah, I, I thought so too. Um, I guess where it's talking about here, saying having a mix of one or more i3 metal stretch clusters with one or more Elastic vSAN stretch clusters. So that's talking about a mix of uh, hardware types. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's, that would be new. I mean, to me, that reads as you can have i3 yeah. and, and uh, stretch vSAN clusters. Yeah. Within the same, you used to have to have one or the other. You couldn't mix. So if I uh, if I can just ask you, just double checking on that, uh, Zach, while we're we're on, and we can get you 100% answer, PJ. Yeah, I'll check it out. Cool. Um, so the cloud marketplace. Now this is an interesting one. So all all cloud vendors um, have some form of marketplace, and we've we've had a, a kind of marketplace with some of our other products as well, like prior incarnations of uh, VMware VCAC VRA kind of product stack for on-premises cloud. So the um, the cloud marketplace is um, a uh, a partner. Um, led, oh, it's an initiative where partners curate their own um, products and then place them on the marketplace for you to deploy. And it's not actually just listed for um, VMC usage. So if you have any form of cloud, whether it be on-premises or VMC backed or partner led VMware cloud, you can deploy these, these product sets. So uh, this is available literally from vmc.vmware.com slash solutions migration. Oh, sorry. <laughs> slash cloud hyphen marketplace right and then you can have a quick look for published solutions so these are all vendor published solutions um there are a couple of backup ones in there i think yeah dell emc avamar uh emc network uh, uh druva all backup sort of providers and then big uh, f5 big ip and these are uh pretty easy to deploy i was uh i was running through uh one of these earlier myself and um i just thought what i'll do is i'll i'll look at i think dell had a um a little video that takes you through how easy it is to to deploy uh and it's very simple you just link your uh your product that you deploy the the VM uh, to your SDDC and it deploys and then you punch in some configuration configuration information um, and then you kind of have the support from the vendor for that product set so pretty good um, thanks Zach so you've uh, you've just posted back in the chat for us about Elastic vSAN what do we got here 
So stretch clusters for VMware Cloud on AWS. Um, it's the second one up from the bottom oh, on that section. Cool. Uh, it says, can I have a mix? Oh, there we go. Basically, basically the same info, but it adds specifically the R5. So it's just talking about stretch uh, stretch clusters. Okie dokie. Okay, so yeah, you can mix stretch clusters and Elastic vSAN within the same SDDC, but not it doesn't differentiate between uh, whether you have um, Elastic vSAN on uh, just R5 or I3. And it always used to be just R5. So um, again, if you can just dig into that, it'd be useful. Um, but uh, yeah, so just jumping back to the marketplace, um, th this is only going to grow, obviously, with a number of partners um, that we we have uh, relationships with that produce VMware specific products. This is going to grow. Um, so one to um, bookmark, I guess, and, and just check back for regularly. There's um, some 20 odd, I think, on there at the moment, 2030 um, from uh, the biggest one. Now, this is an interesting one. I saw this uh, myself earlier as well, uh, and I've had some experience of the SafeNet product in the past. Um, and there was an interesting um, caveat when using SafeNet for doing um, key management. Um, and that it was uh, physically locked. The key management server, the KMS, was physically locked to a host. And if you uh, had to blow that host away for any reason, uh, you ran into difficulties because there was some kind of um, key that was hard coded into the product that meant it could only run on that host and couldn't be vMotioned. So it looks like um, Talis SafeNet have. Uh, Talis Jamalta have got over the constraint there, which you know seemed a bit of a, a big constraint in a virtual world. So that's a really good thing to see because that's a, a pretty robust set of uh, security products there. So uh, yeah, nice to see. So the uh, the marketplace definitely want to check back onto quite frequently. Um, and then uh, the content library is a really good thing. So you can now do in-place updates of VM templates, and then you have version control as well. So you can uh, launch a launch a template, and turn it into a VM or deploy into a VM, update it, and then save it back to your library. And then you have version control on the uh, the, the VM. So you can do for you know, interrupt testing, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, something I'm really happy to see, actually, um, is the build out of what we call the, the migration solution. Um, and I, I did just jump into that a minute ago. Now, I don't know if anybody of you, any of you have seen this at all, but it's it's kind of a almost a step-by-step -step of how you get up and running with uh, AWS, uh, VMC on AWS, how you um, set up your migration tooling, and then how you migrate into the platform. Um, and it's it's as easy as uh, wizard-driven almost. So if we look at plan, so, you know, three common stages, plan, build, and migrate. If we look into the detail of planning, it's actually telling us um, what we need to do and where we need to get the information from. So how do we get up and running on VMC on AWS? Well, here's a, an onboarding presentation and here's the onboarding handbook. Um, how do we create the prerequisite AWS account? Well, there's some more information here. There's a link to create a VMware account. So there's, there's a whole stack of information and you could literally work through this um, if you've never ever um, deployed VMC on AWS, you've never migrated, you've never done anything with it, you could come to this site and you could uh, uh, work through it steadily and be up and running. Now, the more complex your on-premises environments are, then uh, obviously getting uh, getting assistance from your VMware partner or from the likes of myself and uh, Zach as uh, customer success architects is uh, advisable. Um, and, and certainly can't help, but if you don't have access to those resources or you're a, a smaller partner or a self-subscribed customer, then absolutely, this, this gives you the ability to um, uh, enable yourself during the process of getting up and running and, and deploying. Um, I think as time goes on, we're only gonna see uh, more of these kind of uh, guides from uh, from us published. Um, so there'll be, uh, let's let's see, in the future, I'm, I'm hoping to see a disaster recovery 
um, sort of solution set, how to get up and started and running, and our internal product set use for that, and then mechanisms for performing DR and failover and that sort of thing. So uh, again, another one to bookmark. And, and as I said before, this is vmc.vmware.com slash solutions slash migration slash launchpad. Okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, some really interesting things come out in the last uh, last month. Um, and then a, a further little update came out a week after the, the major um, M8 version that came out was the, the ability to configure the resolution address now for the HCH manager rather than a, uh, a predefined one. So this gives you the ability to um, connect your HCH manager um, either via a public or a private IP address. Um, and that's obviously if you're using a direct connect or the VPN connection and the public IP can be used while connecting over the internet. So uh, you can now reconfigure this within the settings of your SDDC. Uh, again, so that was requested and, and links to all of these um, in the docs are provided under each section just to brief, give you a bit more information. If we look at the, uh, the HCX one, very simple. Go into settings, expand your FQDN, click edit, and then uh, change your public or private IP address. And uh, Bob's your uncle. So very quick run through of the latest release. Um, I don't um, I don't see any more questions coming through on the uh, Q&A or the chat as it stands at the moment. Um, do we have any other questions from anybody else at all? Or do we have anything else? Um, that you'd like us to cover or go into in any more detail by any chance? Give you a, a few seconds. Right, well, let me then uh, throw you under the proverbial bus for a second there, Zach, and, and just ask you uh, what, you've been, uh, what you've been working on in the last week or two, um, what you've seen, what's new, what have you been uh, spending your uh, extremely uh, resource constraint time on oh uh, so yeah last week uh me and akeem had um we were working on our our lab and as i mentioned part of that was redeploying our sddc to get up to the 1.8 version yep uh because they don't upgrade our sddcs because we're just it's basically a lab environment so Anytime we need to upgrade, we just redeploy. Um, so we did that, and then um, to on the on our physical lab, we removed NSXV and, and moved everything to NSXT. Yeah, how, how did that go? Um, it was uh, interesting. Uh, Akeem kind of did um, a lot of that. Uh, we ran into some issues with moving everything to uh, to the NSXT NVDS, um, but he was able to get that get it working. So I believe literally all the networking is running off NVDS in the lab, and that's kind of in line with uh, what's how it's actually working in in VMC SDDC. Yep. Because all the networking is backed by the NSX uh, NVDS, so we want to get that, you know, updated in line um, to be ready for any sort of future potential, you know, federation between like on-prem and, sure. and the cloud. It's an interesting point, actually. So what we're actually having to do with it being an internal lab is something that um, our customers will never have to do because it's a managed service so we we have all the pain of um updating and playing around with our, our labs to make sure they're on the latest and greatest releases or even uh pre-release stuff um whereas customers obviously if they deploy an sddc they get the latest and greatest every time um and then um through scheduled maintenance their their existing platforms are updated for them right so uh we we kind of take care of that for everybody um so uh so yeah it's good it's good to know it's good to to see that when i came back in it was uh it was pretty much up to date <laughs> so I don't, I don't have to do anything with that which is good um so uh, we've had a, a question come through from alicia as well um wanting to see if anybody's had any customers inquire about the gs007 compliance 
Um, so uh, is that, um, let me see if I can just uh, unmute you a second, Alicia, and then, um, g -g -g -g. right, so I've unmuted you, Alicia, um, and then I'm muting myself, so I'll just go into that a little bit more, and then. Uh... Yeah, thanks. Um, it was just, they had sent over um, a list of the different ones that they had found on our customer-facing website and um, of the different um, certifications. Uh, let's see, um, they listed um, ISA 2701, yep. 27018, 27017, SOC 1, SOC 2, HIPAA, um, FISC, CSA, and Cyber Essentials, but they did not see GS007 on the list and they wanted to know if that's on the roadmap for BNC. So I just thought I'd check with this team. You guys um, I, I haven't, I think you, you were asking about that internally as well, weren't you on Slack? I, I haven't um, seen anything on that. And um, actually off the top of my head, I don't even know what GS007 relates to. Um, I, don't, I don't either. And I, I did get a couple of names sent to me. Um, to inquire with Rahul Dubey or Dubey and yeah. Dobbins. So I went ahead and sent them an email. So, um, you know, I, hopefully I'll get something back, but I just thought I'd check in with this team as well. Sure. Um, I, I haven't, I don't, I doubt you have either, Zach, um, seen any requests or have any awareness of it. Um, no. but it's definitely one that we can um, come back around the loop on. If so, what, what I'd ask of you, Alicia, is if you get any information on this, if you come back to us, whether during one of these calls or, or offline, and then I can just bring it back up um, in the future sure. and, and then good. just mention it. So it, it's worth noting. So you, you said that um, you were looking on our public facing documentation for uh, regulatory compliance certification and stuff um yes. th that kind of thing changes um i don't say fairly frequently because the the process to get or become compliant against one of the, one of the... um regulations is is a pretty involved process generally um and and in some time uh, in some cases it uh, certainly with the the old vsphere world we were looking at being a one or two releases behind often um by the time we came out with a compliance, I know, for example, um, there was a customer I was working with, a, a UK government customer, um, and they requested something. By the time it got passed, it was on a two-year, two-version out-of-date version of vSphere. So there's obviously a challenge for a cloud um, and a public cloud vendor to be able to stay up to date as we're running on the most recent version of vSphere we can in um, VMC and AWS to keep that up to date is, get, is going to be a very tricky thing to manage. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say watch this space, but it's the space isn't going to change that quickly. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, Will. No and worries. I will keep you a bit of what I hear back. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Nikolai, Nikolai Zarecki, you've asked us uh, if we have any reference architecture for high availability in VMC, in particular for a hybrid setup um, part on prem part in VMC. I, I guess, um, the I, I kind of flip that back and say, what is it you're actually looking for um, in terms of reference architecture? Is it f for us to recommend on-premises um, design and architecture to work with VMC, or are you looking for more detailed information about how the VMC platform is designed or what you can do to configure it to make it more highly available? Um, the, the reason I ask that is it's kind of a, a really broad topic. What we do talk about with our customers quite a bit and there, there are some um oh, so mostly about infrastructure services and vmc okay so um i guess as you're aware um we run on top of a we run on an availability zone effectively and, and aws has multiple az's uh, in a region and multiple regions um natively in aws they don't really guarantee any kind of uptime or performance and they say build your application architecture to be uh, tolerant of failures and then deploy more than you need. And if some fail, it doesn't really impact you. Slightly uh, worse off for an infrastructure platform in that stance. So what I would state is that you're, um, and, and, and jump, feel free to jump in, um, Zach, but you're, you've kind of got to look at what the, the requirements of your, your 
business are. So base your requirements against your constraints, just like you would do with on-premises or, or hosted sort of um, normally. If your uh, application isn't self-resilient, i.e. it can't run in multiple zones, regions, AZs, whatever you want to term it, at the same time and stay resilient, then you have to try and make that more resilient at the infrastructure layer. So things like um, stretch clusters, um, multiple failures to tolerate at the, the vSAN layer, um, and, and just drill down and, and try and remove every single point of uh, single point of failure. Um, and, and outside of that, we, we could probably um, dig out some some architecture where we've worked with customers or we've helped design. But I, I don't believe there's any um, reference architecture yet. Um, although there are, um, uh, there, there is a, a website that talks about DR and disaster avoidance and stuff that we publish. So let me see if I can dig that out whilst um, whilst talking. And then if I can, I'll put it on the other screen that's being shared. Um, so that you don't just see me randomly uh, internal Googling. But there, there aren't so much uh, reference architecture for scenarios. I'd say in part because um, VMC is a, um, uh, a managed offered service, so it is what it is with some options configurable within it, but the infrastructure is the infrastructure. And then also because customers' own designs differ so much. Um, and our role as customer success architects is... Um, mostly partially about helping to glue the two things together and make sure that um, what was working on-prem works um, in the cloud and can move between the two, I guess. Is that a fairly good summary, Zach? Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, it's just so many different things you could do to kind of, it's hard to have like a reference architecture for anything. I haven't really seen anything public facing, just be a couple things. Though, as you said, people have done for customers based on their requirements. Um, so. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a tricky one, right? So um, I, I used to work with um, big service providers, um, sorry, managed service providers, not service providers. And um, I was used to find it fascinating and frustrating that um, they, their, their biggest struggle in life as a managed service provider is being uh, rigid enough in their service offerings that they don't have a billion different service offerings, which become impossible to manage, yet flexible enough that if a customer comes along or, or a potential future customer comes along and says, I want the platform to work like this, that, um, that they can offer it or at least uh, get closer to what the customer is asking for, which is further away from their standard offering. And and there are there are managed service providers out there that are one end of that scale, and they literally have three service offerings and say, well, this is what we have, and if you want it, you don't want it. If you want it, you use it. If you don't, then go somewhere else. And the extreme of that is somebody like uh, AWS that say, these are the things we offer. And um, although we're developing new stuff all the time, these are the things we offer. And if you it's not on that list then you know you'll either have to wait or, or go somewhere else all the way to the other end of the scale for with some service providers i won't name and they literally design an entire um, what we often refer to as snowflakes but a, an entirely unique platform service infrastructure support model everything for every customer that they're on board and it, it becomes um uh, a costly way of doing it and, and a, a very difficult way to manage it but that's the way they operate and, and that seems to work for them because they're one of the largest managed service providers in the world so it, it I guess it depends um, where you want to sit but finding that kind of like I said frustrating yet fascinating at the same time now we're in that that space in, in the world where we're offering a managed service and we're trying to keep it as constrained as we can because we are relatively new you know a year or two old in this space um, where we're providing you a managed hosted service um, yet flexible enough um, to offer what people are asking us for i mean you can see from uh, the release notes and the, and the milestone patches and the, the just the speed of release of some of the stuff we, we're dropping out there that we are trying to um, keep that pace and, and offer what our customers are asking for as as quickly as we can, yet maintaining the stability of the platform. And I guess that's that's critical, right? And that our customers are trusting us that we're managing the platform for them and it's going to be as stable as it can possibly be within the realm of software, um, yet at the same time dropping new features out and patches and fixes and whatever else to combat, you know, security things that 
rear their ugly heads or new features and services that people are asking for as quickly as possible so yeah it's a it's a fast-paced interesting world but and i think that leads to um going going back around the loop nikolai sorry i went off on a bit of a ranting tangent there but it, it goes back around the loop to reference architecture and there, there's published information that this is how vmc is built and designed and you can see that within your own sdgc and you have those options to customize it um such as you know stretch clusters multiple az's this that and the other but it's still a very constrained thing and you you scale it up and you scale it out you scale it back in again but it is what it is um it isn't multiple different flavors of the same uh kernel operating system at the same time not multiple different v centers running different flavors unless you are running lots of them and they're part partway through an update process so I, I will absolutely share um i will post on either on youtube when this um when this twitch session gets uploaded to there or um i'll have it ready for the next session any kind of information we have on um referenced architecture um and documented architecture and there may i think there are some customer examples starting to appear i've seen online but i unless it's um curated and kind of signed off i'd be um i'd be careful using other people's architecture and documented designs because they are you know clearly designed um and created for uh, a very specific set of requirements against a set of um constraints and yada 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 so you could pick up um a, a standard design like we have reference architecture for use on premises but i don't know anybody that's ever just dropped a cookie cutter reference architecture down and and run with it um certainly not on premises um so yeah it, it, i'll try to dig out what we can and i'll uh, i'll make it available I'll just make a quick note um so yeah thanks for that nikolai uh, any other questions out there in uh, zoom or twitch land at all Looks like there's a question in the chat. Oh, chat, okay. sorry. Uh, is there a roadmap to have HA on the same availability zone or stretch cluster within the same metro? Um, good question. I, I haven't seen uh, HA on the, it was by HA on the same availability zone. Um, so you're not meaning obviously uh, vSphere HA there, you're just thinking of high availability across clusters in the same AZ? Can you can you just dig into that a little bit more? And as far as stretch clusters within the same metro, um, I guess, uh, no, not that I've seen, to be honest with you. Um, we do have a, a roadmap call coming up, though. Um, so it's certainly one I can ask for. The the other place actually that's that's worth checking for for information like this is uh, the uh, the roadmap page. So AWS VMC hyphen AWS slash roadmap, um, and then you can literally look for uh, stretch and then see which uh, status it has against it. So. Uh, for example, all the things for, uh, with stretch in the title are all currently available. But if you see something in planned, it means it's on our roadmap. Um, it's it's being discussed. It's not actually committed to as a um, a feature yet. If it's in developing, we've we've committed to certainly developing it and testing to see if the the functionality or feature is uh, workable. Uh, preview means we're we're kind of at that pre-release stage and then available. Obviously, it's gone GA and we've dropped it at a release. Um, but definitely worth checking back here um, to see which features are coming. Um, let me think. Uh, okay, HA, that's fine. That's clearly going to be available. Uh, so VMware Site Recovery Chat Support, Alpha on VC. Yeah, so nothing nothing listed currently, and uh, although this isn't necessarily everything that we um, we have that we're talking about developing internally, it's certainly um, a very good list and reasonably up to date as well. And we the the fact that we're sticking planned stuff on there and developing, so you you kind of have visibility of what's coming not long after we we even soft commit to developing it. So uh, I would, if I was you, bookmark the page and uh, and just keep checking back 
um, and there are for for those internal folks on the line there are a number of um, internal confluence sites and then you can uh, go off and get a, additional information from and also reach out to the pms and if you uh, are one of the customers or partners on the zoom chat at the moment i, I would um yeah i certainly ask us and then um you can reach out to any of us uh, directly so you could ping uh ping myself at will rodbard or, or the at vmware cloud aws Twitter feeds. You can email. Uh, you can email into us. You can uh, reach out via the YouTube channel as well, or via this. And then, if you want to drop out um, your your email addresses, if you are external, um, and then uh, you can send that to me privately. I think via the uh, the Zoom chat, and I I'll dig this information out and come back to you. So sorry, I can't give an exact answer there, but it's only because I I haven't seen it. I haven't heard of it. So um, yeah. Cool. Thanks, VJ. Um, I see we've had a few others join as well. Lovanish, um, Palak, um, Paul and Steve. Sorry, I didn't say hi to you guys either earlier when you joined. Uh, any any further questions um, from you guys at all? Oh, configuration maximum change for SDDC. So this is an interesting one. We've actually, I think, just updated uh, big, uh, Eurasian maxim, maximum for vmc i think we've done this recently um we've updated this uh and now publicized it let me see when it was last updated uh 16th of july okay so that's not totally up to date um zach are you aware of any major changes for config maximum no not in the not in the new release. I don't think much changed. Yeah, um, I, I haven't seen any major growth um, apart from around the uh, the numbers of um, clusters supporting stretch clusters in the same SDDC. That's the only major one I'm aware of. Um, but yeah, so uh, again, another page to bookmark, I guess, is the the config maximums. Um, the, there is another one actually that that um, I've come across a few times, and is actually not our config maximum it is the uh, uh aws config maximum page uh relating to networking and direct connect limits and this is one that um a few of our uh we a few of our customers have, have run up against um either because of the way they have used aws natively for a few years and that then sort of changes or has limits imposed on it that are different um Oh, I certainly can, Alicia's apologies. So yeah, the config maximum uh, link I will just post in chat. Um, there we go, hang on a sec. So there's the config maximum, there you go, Alicia. Um, so yeah, the uh, the AWS uh, direct connect limitations that, that exist. Um, and we, we've had a, a few instances where customers um, have hit either the, the VIF limits, or um, actually, uh, primarily this one, the uh, routes per BGP session uh, on a on a private VIF. So there's kind of a, a soft limit that is dictated to us by AWS. I think I've mentioned this on previous calls of, of 16, and, and you can request via support uh, if you have uh, more sessions being advertised. So this comes back around to route summarization that we don't currently offer, but is in is in roadmap. Um, on, on VMC on AWS. So at the moment we can't summarize lots of smaller subnets into a into a larger subnet. So you have to list every you have to advertise every single one and you hit you run into this uh, soft limit of 16. So any um, any other routes that picked up afterwards aren't actually advertised. Um, so we can update that and we can update it to um, something reasonable like 50 or if you really think you're going to smash through that limit straight away we can update it to 100 but as you can see here this is a this is a hard limit set by aws so although it might seem a bit restrictive um from our side of things we we're also uh, <laughs> we're also under the same limit i'm afraid so um but but again worth um worth saving this uh this link here as well so um the uh, user guide limits uh, in AWS. So it primarily hits people around um, their network plan planning uh, sort of phases and or when they've already onboarded, weren't aware of these limits and then suddenly run into an issue where they're not seeing routes advertised and that sort of thing. Um, 
Uh, Lavanish, you've uh, raised your hand to talk. Uh, do you want to type in chat or uh, see if I can allow you to talk? There we go. Uh, so you are muted, but there we go. Yeah, the, uh, my question is, sorry, I joined a bit late. So my question is around HA. <clears throat> sure. So so our, our goal is to achieve four nines of uptime, right? So how should we configure uh, or architect this layout in, in uh, because because the max you guys offer is three nines for for availability zone zone right your your SLAs so <clears throat> so how should we architect or do you have any reference architect to to increase our uptimes and achieve those goals? Um, uh, yeah, I guess I guess that would come down to uh, back back to requirements slightly. Um, and then working within the constraints of uh, your your application architecture and your cost is going to be a big one. So having um, let me think. So having uh, a stretch cluster, um, if you're running an application or or a, or a workload that's sitting on a stretch cluster, then you've got increased uptime there. But that's going to double your host count. So as a minimum you're going to be running a cost of six hosts for a stretch cluster, not three for a single site. Okay. Uh, and every time you add a host, you're doubling that. You're having to add two hosts. So that's a major constraint that people have to take into account. Um, you could uh, increase your failures to tolerate ratio um, for your for your virtual machine. So a, a vSAN setting. Um, there, there's, a, there's a number of things you can do. And I think I'm so, it's difficult to... Um, try and dig out those docs whilst talking a bit maybe zach if you can just go in and see if you can dig out the the link that talks about um the uh, dr and disaster avoidance stuff if you've seen that um there are a few documents and if if we can't find them during the call like i say um i will try and ping them out to you afterwards and i'll put some links on to uh, the various chat streams that this recording will go out to as well for those listening via the recording but yeah, yeah. It, it's um that we can achieve i think it's um four or five nines now depending on configuration and, and I, again without having the the link in front of me it's difficult to to confirm but by stretching the cluster and by increasing the failures to tolerate ratio you're going to get a higher a higher availability now there's something there are things worth remembering okay is that um you you still have constraints placed on us by by AWS and the, and the nature of how we deploy. So um, the fact that you're not like you're unlikely to be stretching between geo regions, for example. Um, so you're still reliant on AWS's infrastructure. Um, you're reliant on latency that you, you may have challenges with latency. So it's, it's very much a you tell me um what your constraints are and then we design around them. constraints and requirements effectively um happy to have an offline chat about that i think it's a bit of a a bit of a deep subject to go into in the remaining 15 minutes but also it, it is a very much a uh, it depends kind of answer yeah that's fine if, if costing is not a concern because that is our biggest the biggest goal we want to achieve when we are migrating to vmc is to increase our uptimes right we sure. definitely want Eight, four nine so costing is not a concern but we would definitely want to see that reference architecture how you plan us to architect that way so that we can hit our goal cool okay so the, the service level agreement document uh indicates four nines availability commitment for stretch cluster across more than one availability zone brilliant okay so what four nines you have to do a stretch, stretch. cluster stretch cluster is fine it means what about the databases underlying databases does the does the stretch cluster support the underlying databases application across stretch cluster that is i mean it'll support any vm that you'd have to determine whether or not your database supports stretch cluster i guess it'd be that the other way i mean it is the the stdc infrastructure doesn't care what what the VM is, if you're talking about operation or, you know, application level, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You, you'd have to dig into how your application recovers from a, from a restart, I guess. 
in an HA okay. event. So, okay. So we have a different option for stretch cluster. Let's see what is the latency will look like. That will define. That's fine. If there is any reference architecture, we'll appreciate that. You know how to. Keep sure. It. Yeah. I, let Let me see if I can dig it out, and I will. Um, and I'll ping stuff available. Um, when I can, let me just uh, grab a grab a, a quick note of everyone's names. Right there we go. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. So any any other questions out there at all, um, or anything else you'd like to uh, to to chat about today? Cool. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I will. Um, I've got some homework. So. Uh, I've got some homework for you, Lavanish and Nikolai and uh, VJ. Brilliant. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I was after. But it was all good. I mean, um, I, I'd much prefer to get tricky questions or uh, developing questions that um, require a bit more uh, in-depth response than, than none. So it's been, I think it's been a good good call today. I hope you guys online have, uh, have enjoyed listening to me rant. Um, and uh, for those listening to the recording or on Twitch, obviously we'll post this up to YouTube later on. Um, we've got a few a few live views on Twitch, I think three on there at the moment. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, any, uh, oh, here we go. Nikolai, did you just post a quick question? You jumped in there at the end. For customers who have sensitive apps in hybrid setup in VMC, how do you help them determine AZ in AWS with least latency to their on-prem location? Good question. Um, the, I guess the least latency is going to be the one closest to them, theoretically, right? Um, and the only way you can really determine what that latency is, is by dumping something in that AZ, dump a test machine in there, and then uh, run, run workload testing against it. And I, and I guess that's probably the same recommendation that um, AWS would state. So if they've got three AZs, they would say deploy in each and then run workload testing against them. Um, there's, I don't believe, well, there, it's almost impossible to, to state what the latency would be because everyone's in a different location. They have different pipe uh, availability to them. So yeah, it's it would be a case of suck it and see, I'm afraid. Um, you In the same way that you do if you deployed a new data center yourself um, anyway, and it wasn't a hosted, your own data center, it was a hosted whatever, you would drop a workload out and then play around and see what you've got available to you really. Um, things like uh, Direct Connect or um, other connectivity mechanisms are going to give you greater throughput, but it depends again on, on your your infrastructure design and, and how you're connecting. Obviously, if you are running over a, um, an IPsec VPN or, or something, you, you're going to have uh, overhead, I guess. So that's going to impact you. So yeah, it's going to come back down to design and, um, and testing. And there's, there is no quick answer, I'm afraid, Nicola. Yeah, exactly. Just through test and trial only. And I, I, I apologize. I was calling you Nikolai for some reason, but it's because I've got a couple of colleagues called Nikolai. So Nikola, apologies. Cool. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks uh, for the questions again today. Thanks, Zach, for uh, supporting me. Um, as I said, we'll post this up online as quickly as we can. And uh, I look forward to catching up with you guys next week. And for those of you that had asked me questions, um, I've got my homework. I will uh, I'll dig out some information and see what I can get over to you as quickly as I can. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks.